Welcome to another Sustainable Stories series episode. Today we have a fantastic guest with Michael Rutt, Managing Director of SMA Australia. Really looking forward to this interview. Michael and I don't know each other too well personally, but uh, I've certainly watched him from afar and been very impressed with what he's done with the company and uh, the expansion that's occurred under his tenure. Uh, it's well over four years now that he's been at SMA and I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, the Sustainable Story series really is looking at supporting businesses right now that are struggling, people in the solar and energy storage industry that are having a hard time during coronavirus and, and really looking for a little bit of inspiration from uh, senior leadership now uh, who have been successful in their careers and being resilient during tough times. Uh, so we've got Michael on the, on the conversation today. And uh, Michael, welcome to Sustainable Stories. Thanks, Russell. Thanks for the opportunity to join you and uh, and be part of uh, be part of your program. Um, I yeah, really, after seeing the initial uh, the initial interviews with Kane and uh, with Demush, I'm I'm looking forward to being part of it, and uh, hopefully, I don't disappoint the audience. Yeah, I'm sure you won't. And I mean, look, you've got you've had a really interesting career, Michael. You've uh, you know you've been in solar for a while now. Um, you've had previous uh, positions at. Shuko and SunPower and you know different organisations and you've really uh, established yourself well at SMA. I mean, you, you're there for over four years. Is there a particular passion that's brought you to solar, or did you kind of just land on your feet? Uh, I, I, I'd love to say it was by divine intervention or skill set of my own, but it was it's probably just dumb luck, to be honest. Um, uh, yeah, my, my initial career background was in the construction industry, um, in particular working with um, architectural products. And, and then I moved to household appliances and, and dealing with big box retail. And um, it was a career hiatus that, that sort of drove me to rethink where I was, what I was doing with myself. And luckily I spotted an ad, talked about the renewables industry, and I thought, Okay, let's give this a go, and it, it, it turned out to be SunPower. Um, and it turned out to be a regional sales role with that, establishing in their dealer networks, and, and sort of that that kicked it along. And um, and and so um, you know, twelve years later, here I am. <laughs> yeah, and it's fascinating, right? Because you've you've really climbed the ladder. I mean, you've just taken those progressive steps to more and more senior roles until you've ended up as you know managing director of easily one of Australia's favorite solar brands. I mean, it's, you know, iconic uh, SMA. We all know and love it. And was that a, a real career highlight when you finally landed in the managing director position? I mean, how did that come from the other positions that you held? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It, it's, certainly, look, it's certainly a career highlight when you get to lead an organization of, of any nature. Um, I think it's a highlight for any manager. Um, but to be anointed the leader of an organisation such as SMA with such not only local market but global market presence, um, I, you know, I think uh, you would be you would be lying to yourself if, it, if you didn't get a certain sense of um, of great self satisfaction out of it. And uh, and you know, certainly it's it's being part of SMA has been hugely rewarding. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I've been very privileged, in, I suppose, in my career to be able to, to, to make the, have these opportunities um, put upon me and be able to take the take advantage of them. So it's uh, you know, it's it's been a real privilege, I, I think. Was it? Was there any sense of like you got the position and you're like, you know, bloody hell, I've bitten off a, a hell of a a large piece of the cake now, and, and you have to kind of uh, you know chew like crazy to, to figure it out, or did you feel very well prepared to do the role from day one. I mean, often you grow into those positions. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and certainly there was a, a component of that. Um, I'd been running the, um, the Zeva Solar organisation in Australia at the time, which obviously was part of SMA as well. So I had some insights into the workings of the organisation. I was very, very lucky to have a predecessor of the likes of Mark Twidell who, um, you know, Mark is not the sort of person that hands you the keys to the car and then sort of just leaves you alone and says, well, you, you know, work out how to drive it. He, you know, there's some really good insights and direction and support provided by, by Mark, both while he was still with SMA and we were transitioning, but also afterwards. Um, and then um, 
a really good team of people who were in SMA at the time. And, and you mentioned Peter Castle, for example. You know, Peter was hugely supportive and uh, having those people who understand and understood the organisation, the machinations, machinations of the organisation was, was really important as well. So I think it was a combination of a little bit of all of the above. Mm. And then I suppose my approach to these things has always been you've just got to hunker down, pick your targets, pick the priorities and start to execute but also then be open-minded enough to learn and, and, and listen to those around you who have been there before. So I think, um, I think a combination of all of that has, has been critical in, in mm -hmm. settling down over the last four and a half years. Yep. I mean, it, sound, it certainly sounds like there's a, a, a level of humility and you know, leaving the ego at the front door to be able to learn and, uh, and really do the right thing by the company to put it in the right position. Is that, is that, sense of humility and humbleness uh has that always been there for you or is that something that's grown over time um it's, it's something that's grown over time i think i was probably like a, a lot of young people entering entering industry at, at you know in their youth you you know you you can't be touched by anything you're, you're inherently overly confident and, and full of self-belief and that sometimes doesn't do you any favors um I think over time I've I've learnt and and I and I do occasionally spend some time talking to to other young younger um, managers and graduates around the difference between ambition and achievement. Mm. And um, you know I'm, I'm a big believer in that that in recognising your ambitions that comes when you can you can note and document the things that you achieve. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think for me. It's always about the achievements that are on the piece of paper, not necessarily the title that's attached to them. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that very much drives me. And the title, the title's great. It's it, it, you know it, it gives you a sense of self satisfaction, but it's it's what you do while you're in the chair or, or in a given position that's the critical piece for me. And yeah, and it's a real uh, meritocracy. I mean, it, you know, based on merit. Um, and I love that sense of you know, you, credit will be given when the merit proves that uh, it's ready to be given. Absolutely. But also, I mean, I was given some advice uh, some years ago in my career. I, I certainly was one of those guys that was full of, you know, passion and enthusiasm and spirit. Mm -hmm. And I remember winding up in a, a corporate organisation, you know, quite a large corporate, and basically as a very disruptive kind of individual that, you know, what, what had an entrepreneurial mindset, but didn't understand corporate culture well enough at that mm. point and basically just told, listen, keep your nose clean. Don't worry about the politics, do an incredible job and you will get seen within the organization and your merit will prove itself, you know, over time. Mm. And that kept me in good stead. And I've certainly passed that on to, uh, you know, many since, because uh, I think that's, that's a real uh, challenging point for a lot of individuals is understanding, you know, how, what it takes to actually climb the corporate ladder and, yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I think um, uh, you know, especially when you look at a lot, a lot of the, especially in our industry, there's so many young, highly intelligent, well-educated individuals coming into this industry. You know, we've got. I'm lucky enough to have some fantastic young engineers working for us who are incredibly talented, but they can't. But they also come with an, the belief at times that things because they've got this degree will just happen and you know pulling them into an environment of saying well your education's great it's the foundation stone of what your career will be it will provide you the platform to recognize your ambitions over time but now it's about let's what are you can you achieve how can you influence your customers how you can how can you um, deliver outcomes to the organization that are positive and, and look to improve and, and I think when you get the, that mindset happening, the, the level of achievement and the positive outcomes that occur escalate exponentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, the uh, Sustainable Stories uh, series is all about uh, supporting people during tough times and, and helping them to build resilience and grit to understand uh, how to manage stress, overwhelm, anxiety. Have you got any instances in your career, in, in the highs and lows of, of your career, perhaps where you've hit those low points and then had to develop muscle 
to overcome those challenges and the anxiety and the overwhelm? Have you got any instances of that? Uh, look, absolutely. I think, I think everybody's career, um, no matter how good the end outcome is, has got those hurdles that fall in front of it. You know, um, as I said, I, I got into the solar industry after my career took a bit of a hiatus and, and I had to really sit there and say, well, you know, is it is it ego that's driving me to say, I want this role or I want that role or, you know, am I not getting those roles because fundamentally I'm not equipped to do them. Mm. And so I, I think um, I think for myself, one of the one of the key things about being resilient or or being or, or driving success is is self understanding and being willing to execute a level of self observation and self criticism to be able to really understand where you sit in in your market in the world um, as a person, and then um, make those critical self assessments and then exercise change if they need to, um, education, whatever is required to, to seek the path you know, to some form of improvement. Um, mm. and, and I think that's, that's probably the thing for me that was the most enlightening change is, I, um, it is it becoming a lot more self-aware and, and therefore being able to measure and make change based upon that. It's quite tricky. What I've found is for a lot of people, men and women, Emotional intelligence takes time to develop. And for me, it certainly came more so in my 40s. You know, I mean, it doesn't have to be that way, but that's my journey. And what about you? I mean, I think to be able to make those critical self-assessments actually takes some obvious uh, objectivity, but emotional intelligence. Um, and I think it takes time to develop those, those skills. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And you also need people around you who are prepared to sit there and tell you, mate, you need to have a good look at yourself. You know? Yeah. yeah. You know, the old the old adage of it's time to go and spend a little bit, a couple of hours in the room and mirrors and having a good look at yourself. It's, you know, it, it, it's when people are giving you that message, you, know, you need to be prepared to listen to that. And, you know, I've, I've been very lucky with you know, some of the, the people that are around, not necessarily as mentors, but at least people who are honest enough to, to sit there and say, you need to think about this. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that's, um, and I think that's a, that's a critical part of it as well is if you're not mature enough yourself to have that level of emotional self-awareness, you need to have people around you who are prepared to pull you aside, sit you down and go, okay, <laughs> it's, it's time to change. Let's have a look at it. And that's, I think that's been a critical part of my career, which is uh, mentorship. I, I've gone out of my way to seek good role models, mentors, to surround myself with those people where I can actually ask them, hey, what do you think about what I'm doing at the moment? Am, am I out of line? Is this reasonable? Just give me some objective feedback. Yeah. In your career, I mean, you mentioned mentorship. Have you got, or role models, have you got anyone in your life, either personal or professional, in that capacity? Um, I haven't got a, I've never had a, a sort of a structured mentor as such. Um, I've been very, very lucky just to have, I suppose, some senior people um, in front of me or as, as my leaders who I have been able to learn so much from and who've been willing to exchange and, and provide um, information and direction. Um, I've also been lucky enough to have some really, really poor leaders and some really poor work experiences and, and, and been able to sit there and say, well, okay, I'm out of that experience now and I don't want to be that person. And, yeah. and so I think, you know, you need the balance of the both. You need the positive and the negative to work, uh, to work side by side, to be able to make an assessment of, of, of what works and what doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I've been really lucky from that point of view, um, you know, in the solar industry, um, People like Bob Blackiston at at, uh, at Sunpower, um, yep. my uh, my managing director at Shuko, Mark Von Brill, fantastic leaders in their own rights, very different in their approaches, um, but again, very uh, very good at, at providing direction. Um, my first leader, my first manager at um, at Zeva Solar, uh, uh, Sven Schreiber, again another another really engaging individual who was um, very sharing in, in his ideas and, and very willing to sit there and say, I, I don't agree with that, yeah. but we might go that way. Or 
or sit there and say, oh, have you really thought that that process through? So, um, you know, been very, very lucky from from that point of view. And, and, and what, uh, what attracts you to a good leader? Are there certain qualities in, in a good leader that you try and embody yourself? Are there, you know, certain strengths that you try and embody? Oh, absolutely. So, um, um, you know, I, I had a very, very short and very unsuccessful military career as, uh, as an officer cadet at Portsea Officer Cadet School. And one of the first messages that always came across was um, always look after your diggers. And, and I think that's, you've got to look after the people who, who work with you and for you. Yeah. Um, that, that's first and foremost. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean you have to pamper to them and nurse them along. Sometimes that constitutes a bit of tough love, a bit of that. You need to have a bit of a look and think about whether you're heading down the right path. Um, and sometimes it's about nurturing. Um, but certainly I think that, that understanding that, manage, that, that managing your staff also means looking after them. Um, you know, as Kane was talking about, their mental health, mm. you know, their well-being, their aspirations, their desires, um, and being willing to be part, of, be part of their growth is, I think, critically important. And I'm also a big believer in you, sh you, you just as a leader, you can't ask your staff to do something that you wouldn't be willing to do yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's 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 vitally important to me. It's it's the first question I ask myself when I go to give a direction to anybody within our team is, would I do that if, if my boss came to me and said, right, we need to go this way? Yeah, um, and I, I find that vitally important. The two key measures. You mentioned before, you know, again this this balance of ambition um, versus ability, and obviously without enough ambition, you don't get to the top of the game. Yeah. And certainly without enough ability, you don't get there either. Um, how have you found tempering and, and keeping those within balance? You know, because every time you, you get a position that's a little bit more senior, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's worth the piece of paper it's written on. I mean, mm. you, you've mentioned you need to execute and provide results. Yeah. But, but certainly, um, you know, with ambition, you need to keep, you know, driving yourself forward. How have you found, uh, how have you created that balance for yourself? I think there's measures of ambition. Um, you know, ambition, there is the, the ambition that is represented by the need to get to the another, next position, the next position, and the next position. There's also the ambition to be the best person in the role that you currently have. Mm. And, and I suppose that's the balancing mark for myself is to sit there and say, you know, am I being the best I can possibly be at the position I have? right here right now yeah because inherently if, if, if that is your driving ambition and that ties into this sense of what am i achieving then the next roles will come mm. where if if you're not doing that the, the next role has a tendency to be shallow and that's when your abilities become key in whether you succeed or fail. And you may end up in a role where your abilities don't match the position because you haven't achieved in the role previously and used that as a learning experience and a benchmark. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, for me, it's all about, you know, I'm here, I'm now, am I doing the best I possibly can? Yeah. And I mean, you mentioned failure. Often uh, the failures are where the true gold nuggets are because um, yeah. without a few, you know, large failures under your belt, you kind of, you don't have the perspective. Um, how do you manage failure, you know, in your own life? Uh, and then certainly, you know, those that report to you will obviously experience failure. Um, what's your view on that? Well, look, I, I think I'm, I'm a big believer in this, um, in this, I suppose, the direction of, of responsibility. So if somebody in my team fails in a sense, um, I'm responsible for their failure. It is inherently mine to, to understand why that failure occurred and then conduct the necessary um, analysis as to why it, it did occur and then make the corrective action. Um, I think you know, we always talk about failures being the great learning experience, but you know, I, I think the first rule is if you do fail, you just don't make the same mistake twice. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the, uh, that's the definition of failure, you know, the same mistake over and over. Absolutely. It, it's, it's not that you get something wrong. It's that if you get something wrong multiple times, well, then all of a sudden you've got a real problem. 
Yeah. Um, my, my, I believe that using failure as a catalyst to both personal and, and uh, development of the staff and team is, is critical because it does identify a, a learning pathway. You know, it doesn't. It allows you to. It, it allows you to say, okay, well, if you could do that again, what do you think you would change? And it, it allows the and allow staff to conduct that little piece of self analysis and that you know and develop the emotional maturity to self self assess where they're sat, why they've done a particular action or made a particular decision. So, you know, failure is critical. There's no such thing as an organisation that doesn't fail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think right now in, in the industry, uh, a lot of businesses will be at that point where they might be shutting doors. They might be going through some, you know, staff layoffs or uh, failures. You know, uh, many businesses will be struggling financially. And uh, I think, you know, many of us have experienced that in, in the solar game over the years. It's a, it's a tough game. Um, I mean, do you have any particular advice for those businesses that are really having to make those tough decisions now about what direction to take. Uh, because, you know, decision-making, uh, sometimes you can have all the, the data in the world and it's still not going to help you make that key decision. Any yeah. advice, you know, for those out there at the moment? Look, I, it's, I think those in the corporate world have the, the privilege of being able to not have the necessarily the emotional connection to the business in the same way that an individual business owner has. You know yourself as, as somebody who's owned businesses and, and owns a business now there is a certain uh, emotional attachment that you know makes it very very hard sometimes to step out and make the critical calls that you may need to make and add to it such an unknown commodity as, as the COVID-19 virus and, and the situation that we're currently dealing with I think I think one of the first rules is is get somebody to help you yeah. Get somebody who can put a very analytical, unemotional view across the business and help you make the decisions that you may not be able to make emotionally yourself yeah. to help you rationalise those decisions. I think that's absolutely critical. Um, in these situations, de-emotionalising is so hard because we're all emotional at the moment about what's going on. You know, we've all been... We've all been locked in the, 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 the home called prison for a period of time now. We're all, we're all getting a little stir crazy. We're, we're not exercising. We're not having the social contact and so forth. So, you know, making decisions now um, is really, is it probably even harder than what they would normally be if you had a business under duress. So I think independent advice is, is, is really critical. Mm. Um, and, and, uh, and then I think you need to you need to also make decisions based upon the fact of, of not what do I see tomorrow, but what do I see in next year, the year after, the year after. You need to put a timeline on to your your decision making and, and your strategizing too. Because if you if you only deal in the immediate, um, then tomorrow will throw another challenge. So you, you need to be prepared to look at what could six months look like, what could twelve months look like. And again, that's where I think the independent view is also really helpful. I think it is. Um, I mean, in my own journey, I, I've reached out and sought uh, advisors, to, you know, to give that objective opinion into the business and to have, and not just, you know, once or twice, but like an ongoing relationship for a period of time where they can actually really learn the business and its, and its dynamics. I think if you're in small business, I personally believe that's critical. There are small business mentoring services out there. Uh, state by state that are typically supported by state governments. Uh, Bruce Hall, who I have already interviewed and will be releasing his interview in, in the coming weeks, um, basically has done a lot of that work with state governments uh, around uh, small business mentoring and he's mentored 1,200 businesses and, and he provides a lot of great advice around actually just having that key advisor, just as you've said, to help you make those uh, judgments and, and those key decisions is critical. And if you're in corporate culture, then you can easily seek out a, a senior manager or someone from another department. Yeah. Just say, listen, you know, would you be open to having a, a, a little check-in occasionally, you know, just to, to sense check, to bounce yeah. off you. Yeah, yeah abs abs absolutely. And I think the other thing too is it's, 
it's really important to bring in people who have a, a broader external view of the market because again, in a, in a small business, you tend to be insular. So you look at the four walls of your own business, you look at the financial constraints, you look at the people you have employed, you look at the customers that you have, but looking and, and having uh, a view of the broader market of external influencing factors and so forth is sometimes difficult. And so again, having those external sources of information, and, and we, we have them at, you know, at SMA, we, mm. we don't seek to know the global markets um, in their entirety. So we use um, external services. Um, Russell, you, you've worked with SMA previously in the same yeah. extent. Um, so we use other services to, to bring in a broader base of information that can help us shape our strategies and make decisions um, for the sustainability of the business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you, you come across uh, hundreds of businesses, uh, you know, in, in the space of a 12 month period. I mean, I, I can only imagine how many conversations you have with business leaders and, and certainly over the, the span of your career. Have you found, are there any, uh, is there two or three commonalities that you find in good leaders that it, that's just, that is really common no matter, you know, how senior your position is or how large the business is. Is there something that's common that you've found? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because, you know, from my days at SunPower when I was dealing with, you know, small installers back in the, you know, 2010 and 11 when the solar industry was peaking and and uh, to now where I'm dealing with, you know, guys like the Mush who are running, you know, um, Australian subsidiaries of billion dollar organisations. I think the one thing that strikes me with the successful business owners, whether they're big, big or small, is they know their they know their space. Yeah, they have an acute awareness of, of their market, their customer. They know their space. Yeah. Um, they uh, and they and they use that to the fullest extent. Um, they use that knowledge to be able to position their businesses. Um, Many years ago, I was uh, doing some work in the in the toy industry of all things, and it was when the when the Lord of the Rings film was coming out, and uh, you may know the, the the gaming system with the little models was made by a company called Games Designers Warehouse, and they were the major financiers of the first Lord of the Rings film. Mm. And I was speaking to their regional managing director at the time, and and he described his market as niche compulsives. I said, well, you know, what do you mean by niche compulsive? And they said, well, you know, we have three types of customers. He said, you know, it's no good us marketing to every consumer because not everybody wants to own a dragon from Lord of the Rings. But he said, we've got those who want to play the game. We want those who want to, um, you know, do the hobby, paint the models, make it all look pretty. And then there we've got those who just want to collect the finished pieces to have them on the bookshelf. And he said, in understanding those niche compulsives, we can position our business. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a massive lesson in, in yeah. terms of understanding your business and being able to position your business because you don't have to appeal to the whole market. You just have to appeal to up market. Exactly. Yeah, know your niche and, and play, yeah. play to that niche. And yeah. I think what a, what a lot of small businesses really struggle with is, you know, they're wearing so many hats. You've got like the three hats. You've got the, the manager's hat, you've got the entrepreneur's hat, and you've got the technician's hat. Uh, and it's really, you can't really do all of those effectively mm -hmm. at once. And there's time constraints, time limitations um, to really, to do that analysis, to understand your demographics, to do some survey of your existing customer base and actually take a step back and ask yourself, are we even, we even like pointing ourselves to the right customers and playing in the right space. You know, <laughs> yeah. Maybe we're advertising and marketing ourselves to, you know, young 30 somethings and actually we should be doing it for retirees or, mm. you know, whatever it might be. It's really tricky. And I think a uh, small business, you know, starting out, I mean, really struggles with that. Like how are we going to be a solar power installer, uh, a marketing person and a salesperson all at once? Plus, yeah. uh, everything else. I mean, that was <laughs> yeah. the journey I had to go on. It's yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's also about, you know, inevitably people who start small businesses do it because there's a passion. Yeah. And it's really tough to turn your passions into a revenue stream. Yeah. yeah. Because, and again, it's that emotional content, isn't it? it, it it's that ability to separate, oh, look, I'm really passionate about this, but there's no money in it. 
yeah, yeah. And then the, but I'm really passionate about it, so I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah, you know, that's 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 potentially the pathway to failure. So, you know, I, I, again, I think it's, it's the tough thing for small business is this de-emotionalizing piece, and 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 finding the niches and everything needs to you park the passion. It's the driver. It's the bit that gets you out of bed every morning. Yeah. But you've got to execute sound business plan and strategy. And and um, yeah, as you said, you you have to be able to put the passion aside because. You've got to be account. You've got to be the accountant and make sure the BAS is done, and you know your, 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 your PAYG is paid. You've got to be the procurement officer because you've got to make sure you don't have too much inventory, and the inventory you've got is the right inventory. And 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 you've got to be the marketer so you can get your brand out there. And then you've got to be the sales guy. You've got to bring the revenue. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's 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 all of those pieces. And so, what do you what do you do to manage your own emotions? You know, throughout. Uh, you know, personally, professionally, I mean, it's, it's a tricky space because I, I've certainly found that there's a commonality in, in good leaders in being able to have the emotions and, and focus it and channel it into what needs to be done as opposed to being overwhelmed by it. You know, there's a, there's a personal saying that I love, which is turn the struggle switch off, like stop trying to fight, you know, the current of strain and overwhelm yeah. occurring. Yeah. Have you got particular techniques that, you know, you help create peace in your life or you know deal with emotions or is it just head down bum up and just get on with it no not not at all i i, I don't think anybody can just do the the bulldozer um the bulldozer approach to um to stress and anxiety and, and so forth. i've i've got uh, over 20 years of mar over 20 years of martial art and it is uh it is my haven away from stress business Everything, frankly, um, yeah. and uh, I use that, and um, you know, a, a focus on trying to be as fit as I can. I don't always succeed, but yeah. um, as, uh, as as my as my wife will constantly tell me. Um, but uh, yeah, martial arts for me is an absolutely vital part of my overall coping mechanisms because yeah. it allows when I walk through the the dojo door and you know, bowing on a mat. There is there is only one thing, and that is that environment. And, and so everything that is external is is not an influencing factor, and it, it goes away. And whether I train for an hour, two hours, it, it, it's gone. Yeah, and that's well, absolutely vital. And I think um, I mean you hit a, a particular um, theme of, of focus. You know, being able to focus. So when we've got so many distractions coming in, how do you focus your mind? And, and obviously, martial arts is a well known avenue to be able to learn focus and discipline and concentration um but i guess for those that don't have that particular skill base uh do you advise you know young people that are growing within their own you know careers to to go off and find a you know something outside of work to be able to you know develop these skills or to do a course or you know i mean it the people that do martial arts have incredible gifts in that particular region. And I think not all people do. Some people are a little bit more flighty and scattered and really need to develop those skills. Now, have you got any advice for, you know, those out there that are looking to ground themselves a little bit better? Oh, look, I, I, I certainly believe that you have to have something outside of the office. Um, I, I can remember many years ago um, interviewing for a, a couple of roles in a company I was working for. And interviewing a particular individual, and when I asked him, you know, well, tell me the such and such story, it was it was work, 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 work. The the um, term I'm very career focused came out on a number of occasions. And I said, what else do you do? And he said, oh, nothing. I said, what? <laughs> and yeah. he said, no, nothing. And as we started to dig into it and talk with him, you could see that this guy was just powder keg. He, yeah. He's it, it. It was not going to take a lot for him to just explode and and so yeah i, I really encourage and, and we at sma we very much encourage our staff to have a life yeah. um it, it's very easy for us not to we work for a german company so we can work from early in the morning until late at night and phone calls and so forth but you now we encourage our staff to go home be with family have part time you know i've got other martial artists in sma i've got musicians um, I've got people who do yoga. We we run health and fitness programs within the organisation. You know, we encourage people to eat well. Um, I, I think, yeah, it's absolutely. It, it doesn't matter if your passion is reading a book. Yeah. 
just do something that um, gives your mind an opportunity to go to a different place. Yep. And, and I think it's absolutely vital. It is. And what I've found is that a lot of uh, senior leaders often have particular morning routines and structures and habits. They, they get them in that headspace to set up their day correctly as well. Now, some people will use those hobbies and pastimes. Uh, have you got anything that you do in the morning in particular? I mean, that, you, that get your mind in, in the game, in the right space? No, I have a history since I was a very, uh, since I was a teenager of being the most appalling morning person you've ever met in your life. <laughs> so, if, if, to be honest, if I've got my shoes on the right feet in the morning, I've done well. Um, <laughs> so, no, not, not at all. Um, I, I'm probably pretty lucky like that. I can just sort of get up and, and get into it. Um, I find I need my control mechanisms to kick in at the end of the day when the stresses have built. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, as long as I've got my feet on the ground in the morning, I've, I've pretty much, that's, that's achievement number one for the day. Yep. Yeah, I mean, often for a lot of people, it's make the bed. That's, <laughs> you know, it's task number one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, yeah, but no, I, I, go to the, I try to go to the gym in the morning a couple of times a week. And um, despite my displeasure of getting out of bed, it's it's very much it is a good healthy thing to do. It does kickstart the brain. Um, but I do all my martial arts training at night, and I find that's a nice way to bring a certain amount of peace and composure so that you sleep well, yeah. and that allows you to have a better morning. Um, and, and so trying not to have those nights where you're lying in bed going, "Oh right, I can solve this problem at two o'clock in the morning," and oh, it's now three o'clock. Yeah, but I can fix this one as well. So. I think getting that balance between the two and making sure that you, you do get the, the right rest and and, um, and give your brain just that time to just turn off. Look, it's really, really tricky. I know certainly, uh, I mean, I had my own companies for, uh, well, the initial ones for 10 years straight uh, before I, you know, started to work in corporate culture and then I came back to self-employment. And uh, there were many mornings waking up at, you know, 3, 4 a.m., worried about, oh, look, I've got to pay that, you know, $300,000 bill tomorrow, you know, I've got to, you know, and there's always a stress or a strain mm -hmm. and it can be really tricky. And I think it's, it can be really difficult to, to find that balance for a lot of people. I mean, yeah. when I set up um, Enphase Energy and brought them to Australia, the mm -hmm. micro inverter manufacturer, I was working 16 hour days and mm -hmm. uh, that was just the norm. You know, I would often be entertaining and, until 11 at night, you know, with clients or staff and, and start at, you know, 7, 7.30 in the morning. And it, it takes a real toll and, and it, it's tricky to find that balance and to, to be able to switch the mind off. And it, it's a skill that um, comes easily for some and, and not so easily for others. And uh, I know certainly, you know, meditation can help for those that are interested in that kind of thing. But, um, or just some exercise at the end of the day, or you know, just taking the shirt off and hanging it on the door. You know, get, yeah. take yeah. the shirt off, disconnect. I think it's also, a, I think also, it, it's a critical part of developing the correct corporate culture. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think corporations can get to a point, whether by desire or not, of just allowing these things to sort of self perpetuate. Yeah. And and you know, I I've, I've got some staff who work with me who. Are, highly dedicated to what they do, very passionate about the industry. And you know, I've had to, I've been in the office at seven o'clock at night and walked up to them and gone, go home. Yeah. You know, and, and, and sometimes you have to do that. You have to sit there and say, right, we're stopping now. And that includes you. So, you know, I think also developing a culture within the organization that, that recognizes their dedication, but then also recognizes the fact that that dedication doesn't have to come with hours and hours of end-on-end -end sacrifice in their own personal time is really important. Yeah. And getting that message across to staff is, is important as well. Look, it's fascinating because, um, you know, really good businesses will always have a strong set of values that underpin the culture. And what I found in corporate uh, companies, you know, that often the values might be written on a piece of paper, but they have to be embodied. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they don't. And, you know, especially if you have an international head office and then you have to try and, you know, replicate 
those values and the culture in, in the local sense and which means you have to create it and I, you know it's something that needs daily attention to make sure that you, know, you all understand what it's about and and it's been lived and, and breathed and yeah uh, it's not easy no, I mean, no. is it how how do you build that within sma australia is there something particular course that you take or oh for me, rule one is uh, every time I arrive in Sydney, the first thing I do is I walk around the office and I just simply say hi yeah. to everybody. Yeah. Um, everybody needs to believe that they're valued. That's, that's rule one. Yeah. Um, and I think then it's all about, you know, we, we, have the, we have the privilege of being an, an immensely diverse organisation. Um, I think we've got, at last count, there was 23 nationalities in our office. Uh, or within the organisation, um, we've got um, a, a good dispersed male and female employees at all levels within the organisation. Um, we've got different levels of education, different skill sets, immensely diverse organisation. And, and I think the one thing that we do is that we we recognise that and we reward it. Yeah. And so we try to create an environment of, of simple sharing of, of different cultures. You know, every year we have a thing we call International Food Day. And every staff member brings in something for lunch to share with every, all the other staff from their own culture that they've cooked themselves. Mm. And look, some of it's challenging. Can I, can I tell you that braised jellyfish? Not my favourite. <laughs> However, we accept that and, and, and we give prizes for the best food and so forth. And it's, it's become an immensely important part of our annual calendar. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think these things build this, I suppose, camaraderie yeah. within the organisation. And then it gets people thinking about, oh, what else can we do that's fun? What else can we do that, that gets people together? And then we encourage teams to do the same sort of things. We, we encourage teams to have social events of their own, of their own creation and making. We, we provide opportunities to support those as well. So I think it's all building culture is all about allowing, to a certain extent, allowing the staff to determine the culture that they want to have themselves. Mm. Well, and, and then it's being attuned enough to listen to the voice of, you know, what's coming through from those staff. Absolutely. Instead of, you know, often we try and uh, drive it from top down and it's, you know, becomes too much of a dictatorship. I mean, it needs to be, you know, meeting in the middle and a true collaboration. It's a co-design. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Richard Branson talks about, you know, first comes the staff, then comes the customer, then comes the shareholder. That's, that's the approach. Because if the staff are good and, and well looked after, then the customers are going to be looked after, you know, as well. Absolutely, you're right. any organisation is only as good as the people as the sum of the people that work for it. Yeah, it's just, it's, just, yeah, it's as simple as that. Um, and one person can't shape an organisation. Um, it is a collective um, that that shapes the organisation and then delivers that culture out to the market to engage with its customers. Yeah, Michael, um, we'd mentioned previously uh, talking about you know that. Really, a career is, is a long uh, is a long game. It's a long journey, um, and right now, I think a lot of businesses and, and I mean, this is sustainable stories isn't just tailored to small business. Of course, we're talking to corporates or you know SMEs and all kinds of different sectors: solar and energy storage, clean tech, sustainability. Um, but I'm interested in your thoughts around the long game because right now, uh, a lot of businesses and people in the industry will just be so focused on the challenges right here and now. Uh, and before the, uh, the call today, uh, basically, you know, we briefly discussed that some of the people that have been in the industry a long time have just seen so many highs and lows. You know, it could be rebate changes, tariff changes, and, and different governmental, uh, you know, shifts, you know, liberal to labor and, and everything keeps changing. But there's this sense of the long, the long game. Mm -hmm. And I mean, certainly a German company will always play the long game as a Japanese company will as well. Um, what are your thoughts and, and what can you uh, provide us with about, you know, being able to see past 2020? You know, what's happening in 2021, 22? 
Yeah, like it's it, it's it's tough, isn't it? You know, we've none of us have ever been here before, um, and I think um, it, it's very easy to become um, absorbed by the immediacy of the of the media coverage of the um, you know, urgency of a lot of it, um, by the opinions of all the commentators who are you know have us you know, doing everything from experiencing a minor glitch in the economy to descending into the second dark ages. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's really tough to proportionalise that. I think if you're serious about your business, you, you have, you've addressed now as best you can. You know, the simple reality is, you know, from, from our perspective as SMA, the number one thing was safety and security of our staff then obviously you look towards what can we do now? You know, is, can production be maintained? Can supply chain be maintained? Have we got workloads? How can we manage staff costs and so on and so forth? Once you've done all that, you have to move on to what happens next. Yeah. You have to. And so you, you, you have to look at the, you have to look at the market and say, well, when did this happen last time? Well, the GFC is probably the closest, closest experience we've got to this when the market tumbled. What happened during the GFC? The solar industry grew. And it grew because globally it was a politically and economically sensible area to make investments in that drove employment, it drove positive governmental message around environmental impact, um, around energy costs and so on and so forth. And those messages haven't changed. Mm. And, and what's been really encouraging is being on some of the CEC forums and listening to the push to again drive the solar industry as one of the most capable industries to drive recovery. Mm. So, and then you've got a blue sky think. You've got to sit there and say, okay, if the world is perfect, if, if we get to the end of 2020 and we have a, a cure for COVID-19 and all the, all the doors open and everything's and the lights are on and we're all happy, what am I going to do? Yeah. And then you can start manipulating backwards where I think a lot of people try to build a plan sort of upwards from disaster. Yep. Where I think you've got to go, we're in carbon blue seas. What does my business look like in that environment? And then you can start to constrain backwards based upon market environment, you know, market data, other influencing, other external factors and so forth. Mm. Um, but I think people get too constrained in being reactive to the immediate rather than going, okay, what's the perfect world tell me it's going to be? No, and, and, you know, I, I am optimistic about the future of our industry in, in 2021, 2022 and beyond. Yeah, I, I, I have. Yeah, you know, it, it's sad, but there will be some. There will no doubt be some casualties in in the race to the end of the year. Or you hope that there aren't too many, but inevitably you feel that there will be, and I'm I'm deeply sorry for that. Yeah. But we also know that this industry will be here because it makes sense. Absolutely, and I mean, you know. It survived the GFC and it's it survived uh, countless rebate changes and tariff changes and and I certainly had a, a business that uh, you know it was boom and bust there for a while um, but I think you hit the nail on the head that it's it it is here to stay and uh, that's not wishful thinking that's based on experience and uh, you know we now have a lot of years of the Australian solar and energy storage industry behind us um, and also this. This ability to anticipate, I think you know we need to anticipate that there will be ups and downs. Mm. Um, don't just be reactive. Prepare mm. for, yeah. This won't be the last time that there's a um, uh, a pandemic. I think you know. I think it will happen again. Um, and also just uh, the trials and tribulations to develop yeah. grit and resilience. And that's what that's what these interviews are really all about: is getting insights into grit and resilience and what it takes. Um, how to, to develop those and I think we've touched on a lot of those points today and it, we've had a fantastic discussion and it's certainly been a lot of fun from my end so I, I thank you for that Michael it's, it's no, not great. at all absolutely totally enjoyable and uh, you know I, I hope that uh, you know in some small way I've been able to um, you know 
maybe uh, give some people some confidence or, or uh, at least some understanding that um, you know th there is a light at the end of the tunnel and there's a way to achieve it. And more importantly, that uh, I, I hope that if some of the young people in the industry are listening, um, they're experiencing probably something that they haven't had the opportunity to grow the resilience to. And I, and I hope that um, they understand that, you know, that the lights will turn on tomorrow, that the sun will come up and um, you know, we, will push, we will push through this. Um, you know, I've got a 22 year old son who's been, you know, basically got zero employment because of this. Um, he worked, in, worked in hospitality and, and you know, every morning he gets up and says to me, um, and gives me a call and says, Dad, I've done this today. Or done that today, or did that yesterday, and so you know, I, I think that's um, I, I think that's we, what we have to do is inspire them to keep going. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, so. look, uh, one of the ways that I always finish off these uh, conversations is uh, it's called the three pearls of wisdom. Uh, you mentioned you have a son, and and in the future, perhaps you might even have uh, grandchildren down the track. And imagine it's your your last don't, day. Don't say day. that to me, mate. God Almighty. <laughs> Yeah, not ready for granddad yet. No, I can imagine. You know, I think it'll be always a shock. Um, but imagine it's your last day on earth and, uh, you know, you have a legacy of a, a career and a, and a legacy of uh, wisdom that has been passed on. But you really, you have the opportunity to share three pearls of wisdom with uh, your grandchildren or your children before you, before you go. And it could be a word, it could be a phrase just three pearls of wisdom that you've learned throughout your life, both uh, professionally and personally. Have you got a, something to share with us? Yeah, sure. Look, I, um, you know, we've, we've talked about career, we've talked about achievement, we've talked about business and everything, but I, you know, if, uh, if I had a tombstone and if I wanted something inscribed on my tombstone, I, I would hope that it would say that in the end of the day, that I, I gave everything the best I possibly could and that he lies a good bloke. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, and I think in the, in the race of all of this, I think being, being a decent person and uh, being good to others and, uh, and embracing, embracing uh, community family and so forth is, is, is the end game, the most important thing in the world. You know, we, I think one of my one of my favourite sayings from one of my bosses one one time was um, was he he'd resigned from his role and, he, and when we asked him why he was resigning he said because when it stops being fun you stop doing it yeah it's so true and so you know I I, I hope that I, I hope that um, you know if if nothing else um, you know people just in this industry, embrace the, the broader community of the industry and uh, support each other through what's happening because, um, you know, I think that will be the measure of us all in the end of the day. Yep, and, and to keep smiling and to keep having some fun Absolutely. along the way. Absolutely, you've got to keep kicking the footy around. Yeah, and keep on being, you know, good blokes and, 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 yeah. and good, you know, individuals to each other and support each other during tough Absolutely. times. And look, I, I really appreciate the support that you've given us today. and. Your wisdom and your years of experience, Michael, it's been a real pleasure and to have this conversation. Good on you, Russell. Really appreciate the opportunity, mate. Thank you so much. Okay. Cheers, Michael. Cheers, mate.